Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Testing, testing. There we go. Big fuzzy bear. Also, he's covered in mosquitoes. Check out those mosquitoes. That's what's portraying out there. Okay, so apparently you can't all see the slides. I wonder if it's a problem with that one. Share screen two. Okay, and now present I think this, this will work. captions. So this is now worked. Great, and I have no idea why that worked. There we go. Yay! Okay, cool. We'll do a double check in the overflow room just to make sure. It's working. Okay. How many of you are in the overflow room? Question mark, how is the sound? Good, great, bad. This is good, okay. Okay, let's get started because we have some amazing things to tell you. This is one of my favorite We're classes. We're early. Oh, okay. How are you? <laughs> I'm really excited to get started on this one. I hope it works because we have some videos. Thank you. Oh, we're going to need more of this. Okay. We have some videos. We have some things to tell you about. Sound in the overflow is good. Sound in the overflow is good. I think we're ready to go. Can we decrease the volume of that? Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, cool. So same deal as last time. If you want to um, chat with us, we have the chat going right now. You can join it on Course Link. Um, and if you want to participate in uh, a mentee, we're going to have one coming up in a little while, so not right away. Um, and is that everything? If you don't like bears, fair warning, this There's lecture is very bear heavy. Very bear heavy. And you're, it's you're, unbearable. It's unbearable. I'm going to go <laughs> and put on a jacket too, because you've got one. Yeah, that's right. Nothing says class like jacket over a t-shirt. So I figured what all of you should be doing is writing your institution and asking for a free University of Guelph sticker that you can put on the outside of your window because in this enforced period of a dispersed campus, wherever you're sitting is a Guelph campus. And so I think you all need to get free stickers. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Oh, <laughs> I've got my jacket. Oh, but like pajamas, totally, right? <laughs> okay. 
That's quarantine chic. <laughs> That's QC. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Oh, we're asking for the recipes. The recipes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Drool. Drool. So if you go on to Twitter. We could eat it in front of them. Oh, we could eat it. <laughs> <laughs> we will post the recipes in the announcements on Course Link. And they but, are on Twitter. So and they are on Twitter. Yeah. So um, we can put our handles in there, too. If you want to go and just creep what we've been tweeting lately, you're welcome to. Um, yeah. Cool. Yay. It's been delightful. And you have all been supporting us and our mental health throughout these weeks um, in the emails, um, requests for help. Uh, we've been so far able to help, um, I hope, lots of you, and um, that's that's our job. Um, and just like, you know, work dogs need to feel like they're being useful, so do we. So thank you very much for all of that. It's our pleasure. A question um, about the uh, petition. A question about the petition. What petition? Your petition. My petition. Yeah, sign it. And I just found out this morning that it's going to be published. Um, so it's going to be printed as an op-ed in University Affairs, which is uh, a national uh, university higher education magazine. Um, they aren't doing any like actual printing for the next little while because of COVID, but it will be online. And if you'd like, I can post um, a link to it on Course Link once it comes out. Um, for those of you who signed it, you're amazing. Um, for those of you who are writing to me about how to actively um, work with um, instructors in other courses to help sort of allow them to explore more inclusive ways of having final exams, you're all awesome. We've had some success so far with some of them where there's been a complete reversal, which is amazing, um, or at least an understanding that there has to be quite a breadth of accommodation. Never feel like you are responsible for sucking it up and getting through it or losing that access to grades. Um, make sure that you advocate for yourself. Be kind because I think the biggest thing is that some profs maybe don't have the experience associated with understanding the breadth of new challenges and how to sort of facilitate top down all of those things. Um, so, you know, you can be kind in, in your description of your circumstance and what might help you, but certainly advocate for yourself. Um, and I'm happy to continue to help any of you who are doing that. Um, and uh, we've been doing lots of it, sort of, you know, sort of allowing people to learn about the different formats. Some of you have asked specific questions about the format for our final exam. So, okay. So we are going to go ahead with the final exam, but it's going to be great. And we got your back. Um, what we want is because we don't, we don't want to just cancel it and have you then um, have to take the average that you've got already. We want you to do better than that. So that's why we're going to have a final exam so that you will all do much better than what your average is and that will bump up your grades. That's the intention. Um, so we will still have to wait for the last final decisions from the upper admin, but you won't see it scheduled in WebAdvisor because we've declined to have that lockdown software formal final exam bullshit that, you know, anyway, it's cruel and unusual punishment. So what we're going to hope to do is to have like an extended quiz where we allow you like three to five days to do it whenever you can fit it into your schedule. Um, and if you can't fit it into your schedule, get in touch. We will talk individually. But the idea is that if we open it up for a series of days, then it should allow you the time to, to be able to go and do that, <laughs> kick ass, raise your grade, um, and uh, and leave with uh, with sort of good feelings about about that experience. So that's our hope, and we will hopefully be able to figure out the final plans by the end of this week. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep you posted. We just announced our plans to the world. To the world. So <laughs> yes, it's not going to happen, but we'll we, try. We'll try. Okay, um, but that's that's our intention, um, and uh, we'll we'll keep you posted as as we go along with that. Good. Will everything be the same weight? Yeah, the final yeah. is still the same weight. Still the same weight. Um, okay, let's get started because we have a lot to go through. And it's all bears. And it's all bears. And I hope it's going to blow your mind because, yeah, because awesome. Okay, here we go. So, bears. 
These are the learning outcomes. We want to blow your mind about the evolutionary history of polar bears um, and like bring it all together, physiology, ecology, and what's gonna happen to the polar bears. And do we actually have polar bears? Just hold on to that one for a second. Okay, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. But we wanna talk a little bit about black bears too, because they're teeny tiny all and the so cute. <laughs> so black bears, um, and the reason why we want to talk about black bears is because black bears and polar bears are very different um, in their physiology, in the challenges, the ecological challenges that they experience. Um, and even though they are fairly closely related, not super, super close, but fairly closely, um, there's quite a diversity in strategies and adaptations that have evolved. So the question here that we posed at the very end of last time was to think about hibernation. We told you about the Richardson's ground squirrel and the fact that their bodies can go down to like almost zero degrees. Can you imagine what that would be like to hold one? Like just It's, it's like the frog. It, yeah. <laughs> okay, but bears can't do that. Um, bears are massive things compared to a Richardson ground squirrel. And so if you imagine a Richardson ground squirrel being near frozen. Like a Subway sandwich. Like a Subway know. sandwich, exactly. Six inch Subway sandwich. <laughs> okay, so a six inch Subway sandwich like this, frozen solid. Tuna. Um, because of its surface to volume ratio, um, it's kind of, it's kind of like lightweight, right? So once its metabolism starts going and it starts to like generate heat and start to revive, it can do so fairly easily, but something as big and as massive as a brown bear or a black bear, um, can't do that. It can't have its body dip down and then be able to actually recover to the point of like life so so it doesn't actually go into something called deep hibernation it does something called shallow hibernation it means that yes there's a, a bit of a dip in its body temperature there's a bit of a dip in all sorts of like other physiological functioning but nowhere near as steep as the richardson ground squirrel because it could never recover from that deep dive and now and now rick mercer that uh, because that's what that's what bear research might actually look like. That was filmed, if you didn't catch it right off the bat, it was filmed in Algonquin Park. And we offer a field course in Algonquin Park. Um, so it's just kind of right around the corner from us, which is, to me, amazing. Maybe some of you are from there. Maybe yeah. some of you are from either side of the Highway 60 or on the north side up near North Bay or on the Quebec side. Yep. Uh, yeah, we know now that all of the field courses have, for this summer have been canceled. So the high Arctic course, the Algonquin course, the low Arctic course, the so um, we're sad because we really, really enjoy taking people and sharing these places and experiences with them. But uh, it just makes us look ahead to the next offering. Yeah. And these parks will get a break from us, too, which is yeah. always nice. So, yay. Um, okay, so now we've learned entirely about black bear hibernation. We know that they hibernate. Um, we know that they are shallow hibernators, and we know that lactating females don't really hibernate. They just kind of hang out very lazily so that all of their energy or most of their energy goes to the milk that they need to produce in order to feed their cubs. Um, but what about polar bears and um, all of the things that are going on in the Arctic, um, the differences in terms of the challenges and those types of things. Um, it turns out that polar bears don't hibernate, um, mostly because the winter is actually when they get most of their food. Um, what they're doing is they're hunting for seals on the ice. And um, in the summer, when there's less ice, there are fewer seals. So that means that most of their eating opportunities actually happen in the winter. And it's the summer that is sort of energetically more challenging for them. Now, they don't hibernate in the summer either. They just kind of lazily walk around eating whatever it is that they can come across. But they can't actively hunt for the high energy uh, payload that they're looking for, which are the seals. 
Um, and they're living in a relatively cold environment. And so they have all sorts of energetic challenges, both in terms of acquiring energy to keep warm, but also in terms of keeping the warmth within their own bodies. And so they have a whole bunch of special adaptations to be able to do that, that make them different than black bears and different from brown bears. Or purple bears. Or purple bears. Um, so, um, some of the sort of specific things related to polar bears is that they've got a really, really thick layer of fur, obviously. They also have a really thick layer of fat compared to the other bears uh, that provide an incredible amount of insulation. They've got black skin, um, and that allows them to absorb um, the energy from the sun. Um, and so any amount really helps. Um, they are large in size, so they have an even bigger surface area to volume ratio than the other bears do. They have very short ears, a kind of truncated snout. Um, all of their sort of extremities are minimizing um, that uh, high surface area to volume ratio. So what's going to happen to polar bears in light of climate change, right? Because the environment is getting warmer. And in many respects, when you uh, increase the temperature, you make it harder for them to be able to prevent themselves from overheating. But also because they're hunting seals on the ice, that shortens the time that they can actually go out hunting. Um, and, uh, and so it really does depend on a whole bunch of factors. Somebody wanted to know, uh, if they thought that that one of those last slides looked like toilet paper. Oh, it did look like toilet paper. That's a, a cross bit. section of a hair. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. That's the cross section of a hair and their hairs are hollow. Um, there was a misconception a while ago that like the hollowness allowed them to actually transmit UV radiation to their skin. No, it's just creating an air pocket to be able to sort of level off the body temperature and sort of insulate as much as possible. And yeah, some clarification on course link uh, or on the chat that the skin is black. And yeah. the hairs are what you're looking at. Yeah. Specializations to the cold. So, in the context of this vulnerability, in the context of it depends, um, one of the reasons we like this, this lecture is not just because that there are bears uh, and it's highly bearable, it's because we get to link wah, in wah. some other things that we've been talking about right back since January. Um, and so we're going to look at phylogenies. Yay! That makes me so happy. Uh, this is an old one. This is a phylogeny about of bears. And so you're looking at, um, you can see uh, two principal branches there. And this was a phylogeny that uh, the, it took two, four, six, eight, uh, two, four, six, eight, maybe nine people to do. And I... Uh, this is a fire legend that's 20 years old now, and it's based on one 300 base pair segment of one mitochondrial gene uh, called cytochrome B and or site B. And at the time, 20 years ago, this was like groundbreaking. This is a highly cited paper, uh, and it was kind of a big surprise at the time because in looking at uh, as people were trying to look at the phylogeography of polar bears, they thought, well, let's root it with the other bears that are in North America, the, bla the black bears and the brown bears. And then these bears didn't behave as they ought to. And you can kind of see this. So take a look. There's two kind of principal clades there, top and bottom. And the top one, you're looking at Ursus arctos or these brown bears from Alaska. Uh, different parts of Alaska, Kenai, the Southeast mainland. Um, and the numbers that are in parentheses are the number of individuals that had like an exactly the same. So there's a little bit of phylogeography. So it's this kind of spread of phylogeny across geography that's happening there. But then there's a deep split to where we see Ursus maritimus, the, um, oh yes, the, uh, sorry, the uh, polar bear, polar bear, polar bear, and what the what? WTF at the ABC Islands, another brown bear. What? So this suggested right away that there is um, in, perhaps introgressed mitochondrial DNA of brown bears across the uh, polar bears of the Canadian Arctic and Siberia and Hudson Bay and the Western Arctic. This was a surprise. 
Um, and it's not a thing that generally, remember we talked about species concepts and species definitions and old dead white men, uh, and one of them we talked about that you had all heard of, whether or not you'd heard it was associated with this particular dead white old man, uh, was the biological species concept, that species, a good species is one that can't interbreed and produce fertile offspring. And what you're looking at here is a clear signal of fertile offspring in uh, that followed apparently hybridization. I also want to point out that you can do this. This figure that they made that's in that paper, if you go and look it up, is it's like it's it's not very good. But this took me about 20, all the data is public. And so you can go and search all those little codes at the end. And if you want to actually look at the DNA of the brown bear and the polar bears, uh, you can go and do that. So can I just can I just lady explain for a second? Is that, a, is that a thing? I think you can doctor explain. Oh, even better. Okay, so just to kind of bring in some of the vocabulary that we've been learning in 1070 specifically, what you're seeing here essentially is a clade of brown bears, right? Right here, all the way around. These are different populations of brown bears. This is one population, this is another, this is another. And the ABC Islands are the Admiralty, Baranoff, and, Sh and Chicagoff Chicago Islands, ABC Islands. So these are all brown bears, different populations. But then right in the middle are these three populations of all, of the polar bears. all of the polar bears. That's messed up. Like, it shouldn't be that way. It was a surprise. It was a surprise. But remember, this is doing mitochondrial DNA analysis. So just hold that for a second. So 20 years later, we don't just use one gene or one portion of one gene. Uh, and this is what some other clever researchers published in the journal called Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which is like the third or fourth biggest journal in the world, where they looked at whole mitochondrial genomes, so 16,000 base pairs. And again, you could go and do all this yourself. Uh, it's relatively straightforward. But we've got one additional species up here at the top. Now we've got a black bear full mitochondrial genome, and then several different uh, populations of Ursus arctos, the brown bear, and then all of a sudden with these brown brown bears, we see all of these polar bears. And these are polar bears um, that weren't in the last study. So these are principally uh, polar bears from Alaska and from um, Svalbard, the, the Arctic, Arctic Europe. Um, so it's telling the same story. So suggesting that it's not a that that story that we saw of polar bears appearing inside of a brown bear mitochondrial phylogeny isn't one that's based on too little data. This is a lot of data. Now there's a cool thing here. I'm going to digress and go off on the side. Sorry, but right across. Take a look at that one. So it's called uh, the code. There is ancient. Um, this is we uh, the researchers who did this study were very. Uh, pleased to be able to include DNA, mitochondrial DNA, a full mitochondrial uh, DNA genome that they had extracted from this mandible that had they had pulled out of uh, an archaeological dig or a dig in, um, in Svalbard and in Norway. And they estimate it to be, uh, because of the layer that they found it, about 115 to 130,000 years old uh, from an adult. And so that's pretty cool and it, it will come the timing of that will come in in a second so that's 100 and say maximum 130,000 years old and there it is right in the middle of all of the brown bears and the polar bears from the rest of uh, Norway and across to Alaska so here's a map on the bottom left hand side here you can see we're looking at the from the top uh, down of our globe from the, at looking at the pole and you can see brown bears are coded on this map in um, black or red squares and the red squares are from all over uh, the northern hemisphere uh, there are then different uh, triangles of uh, polar bears across the Canadian Arctic uh, the high arctic of, of europe and norway and alaska uh, and the abc population which we talked about so that was pretty much exactly the same for example as the polar bears in churchill so churchill is down here at the kind of the basal part of the western shore of hudson bay and abc is way out there on the western coast of um, of north america on alaska so keep an eye keep an eye on that phylogeny as you're looking at it. So we've got brown bears, polar bears nested inside of brown bears, 
and uh, brown bears from ABC and polar bears and brown bears elsewhere. And now we've got a question for you. And we're going to go to Menti in a second here. So based exclusively on this tree, polar bears nested inside of brown bears. Let's see, Menti. Got it. Yep. So the code is 231554. Exclusively on that tree, which of the following is not a valid interpretation of the phylogenetic relationships shown? So based on that tree, these things, which is not. Yeah, we can't show both of them, eh? No. Super good. Let's. Uh, yeah, just yeah. in the interest of time. Because Dr. Jacobs has stories to tell. I have story. Well, no, we don't have time for that story, but we do have to get through some slides. So, yeah, good. Okay. So we see there's actually kind of a spread across, but there is a, uh, the other choices, but there is a leading choice in this question. Yep. And that is B. Good. Um, yes, because all of the other ones are, yeah, are possible given the limited information that we've given you. So now we're going to give you some more information. Now for something moderately the same. <laughs> so what we're looking at here is based on this, this black tree, which is um, a, a nuclear phylogeny. So you can see there at the tips, which are now at the bottom, that we have black bears, brown bears, and polar bears. And the observation that we've made with these two different studies over the past 20 years is that there seems to be a mitochondrial leak or an introgression or something of brown bears into polar bears about 160,000 years ago. Now, as you're thinking about these lectures, date that or kind of let that trigger you to that mandible uh, that, was, that was sequenced over there. So what we'd like you to think about, and this is one of the things that we threw out earlier, so which of these two phylogenies is accurate, the nuclear or the mitochondrial? And are there actually polar bears? Think about it for a second. So just to kind of recap, when you do the phylogeny using the mitochondrial DNA, polar bears are actually nested within a clade of brown bears. So basically what that kind of says is that polar bears are just white brown bears and that they're the same species. Let me put a pin in that because I want to come back to that for the brown bear just for a second. Okay. Or should I say it now? And then okay. showing you this one, this slide here, with the nuclear DNA, I think it's quite obvious and quite clear that there are these, you know, divisions along species lines. So what's going on? Hmm. Hmm. Go. <laughs> so I think there are there the bears themselves. Uh, see things differently. They are, there, there are black bears, there are brown bears, there are polar bears. In fact, what the nuclear DNA tells us about brown bears is there may be more than one species. There, there is one name, Ursus arctos, but there's probably more than one species spread across the world. That, what we're seeing here with, the, with these two phylogenies, the mitochondrial in orange and red and the black, is that it's really likely that there was 160,000 years ago some thing that happened, some climatic event where a male, a female brown bear accepted a mating with a polar bear, with a male polar bear. And that produced 
Viable offspring. Viable offspring. And it seemed to have happened enough times, uh, or that that period happened enough, or that it was a fixed event. So there's no longer kind of any population that ha of polar bears that has the original polar bear mitochondrial DNA. And that's why you see in the phylogeny here, the original orange polar bear lineage stops. Imagine a little X right there. Because from a mitochondrial perspective, all of those polar bears are the powerhouse of their cell is a brown bear powerhouse. In the interests of going on. Ooh. Yeah, we're going to skip that one. Okay. We're going to skip a bunch of things now. Okay. okay. But not the... But not this. So, okay. So hopefully, to understand that the polar bears of the past are different than the polar bears of today in that none of their... None of the current polar bears have the original mitochondria of the polar bear. They have all brown bear mitochondria, and that's the result of a hybridization event, large-scale hybridization event that occurred. Now let's bring it forward in the context of climate change and the fact that uh, things are the environment is changing for the polar bears. We can ask, what's the most relevant information that we need in order to figure out what's going to happen to today's polar bears? Um, the answer to this question um, is D. So which species has a range nearest the Arctic, right? If we can think about it, um, it doesn't really matter who's most closely related to whom. If they're so far apart that they're never going to interact, it doesn't matter. So what really matters is who's next door, who's your neighbor in the context of climate change. And it so happens, that little thing doesn't work, but we're moving on. It so happens that if we take a look at who's most close in terms of geography, it is the brown bear. The brown bear and the polar bear share a bit of a border um, where they do come into contact on occasion. But as the climate is warming, we're going to see that happening more and more and more. So the brown bear distribution is in red. Uh, the polar bear distribution is in gray. Um, and you can see that there is quite a, a big international border for those, or interspecies border for those two. And so then we can take a look at the different biology associated with the different species um, and to make predictions about what's going to happen in the context of a warming Arctic environment. All of these things matter, but there are some key ones that matter just a little bit more when we're talking about short-term effects. So here's kind of stacked up the natural history as well as some of the physiology associated with, with each of these species. Um, but the thing that matters kind of the most right now has to do a lot with the way that they feed uh, and how they get their food. So the brown bear is an omnivore. It eats a whole bunch of stuff. It, it has all of, stuff. all of the things. It's got teeth that really allow it to grind vegetation, but also rip apart flesh, right? And eat ants. And eat ants. The polar bear is what's called an obligate carnivore. Obligate meaning it has no choice. It has to eat meat. And in fact, it doesn't really eat meat. It just eats fat for the most part. When it's doing really well, when it's doing really well, it basically just kind of like slurps up the fat of a seal like through a straw, right? So its jaws and its its way of eating really doesn't rely on any kind of strength or grinding ability. It wouldn't be able to process vegetation. Thank you, David Tennant. Amazing. Okay, so polar bears need ice in order to be able to hunt. They are useless otherwise. Um, sometimes they'll get a walrus that's on land, but it's really all about sneaking up on seals that way. So this is important because their whole physiology, their whole anatomy has evolved in the context of eating slurpy seal fat, right? Um, and so they've got these monster big canines in order to catch the seal, but the rest of their jaws, if you actually take a look, they're, they're kind of piddly right? They're not crunching bone uh, because they don't need to. Uh, and they very rarely actually eat the muscle of a seal. They leave that for the fox and for the other gulls and things like this. So uh, the, that's great. 
the result of, of all of that kind of adaptation means that they've lost quite a bit of strength in their jaws. Um, not to say that they wouldn't kick our asses if I, they caught us, right? Like I've, I've looked at polar bear skulls and I've never thought, eh, it's kind of piddly. It's kind of piddly. But, but Dr. Jacobs has. <laughs> yeah, but take a look at the grizzly bear skull. This is massive, right? It is like super thick, yeah. super dense, right? Um, they've got grinding teeth in the back. And these guys, well, their jaws are, yeah. Kind of, yeah, like, Puncturing yeah, books. they just, they hold on, right? Okay. So if we stack up their strength and put it like through one of those like compression machines that measures how much power is needed in order to crush their skulls, um, what you're looking for essentially is the more red, the more weak it is. Okay, so more red areas like what you can see on the polar bear just means that these are all fairly or relatively weak areas where the brown bear has this super massive solid skull to be able to um, to eat anything. Right. You need more strength to manage vegetation uh, than you do to manage meat. And that's kind of like it doesn't seem obvious, but but that's a that's like a physiological rule. Right. So in light of all of that, the polar bear has a real problem because if there's less ice during the year, there's less opportunity to get the seals that it's really well and specifically adapted to eat. Um, there's less opportunity to store fat. Fat is directly related to their ability to produce offspring. So what we're seeing now, like in real time, when we started teaching this 10 years ago, we were saying things like, oh, what we're going to see in the future, what we're seeing today are direct effects of, of climate change on polar bear reproduction. Polar bears can have three cubs. They've quite regularly had three cubs for millennia. Um, but now we see polar bears with one or maybe two cubs. Uh, so it's having a direct effect. Uh, mothers aren't able to get the fat that they need to support three cubs, essentially, as they produce milk for them. And so we see this major difference in what's called body condition, basically their individual health, their ability to be fat and happy um, and well insulated, um, both in terms of temperature, but also in terms of well insulated in that they have lots of reserves, right? In the time of the summer when they can't eat, they rely on those reserves. But we're seeing skinnier and skinnier bears that have a direct effect on their health, but also on the population in that the females aren't able to reproduce nearly to the degree that they used to. So one of the things that we've noticed over the last you know, decade or so is the increase in the number of pizzly bear or growler bear sightings, hybrids. We see them um, mostly when we kill them. Uh, there is a legal hunt that's uh, still um, ongoing. For each species? Uh, for each species, both for brown bears as well as for polar bears. Um, and um, they are heavily managed and heavily monitored. Um, and so occasionally we do see the take of a grizzly bear that has been hybridized with a polar bear, or so a pizzly bear or a growler bear, whatever you want to call them. Um, here you can see actually this one's been baited. So this is a big bucket of frozen vegetables and fruits uh, in order to attract this one for a photo opportunity. Um, but they are hybrids, viable hybrids. Um, all indications or all studies suggest that they, the hybrids are able to reproduce um, and produce offspring themselves. Um, and so because there is this increasing overlap of their ranges, there's lots of questions as to what's going to happen. Um, remember, the brown bear, though, is an omnivore. It can eat anything. It's very, very resilient that way, right? In the context of change, it can figure shit out. The polar bear is this obligate carnivore that doesn't have a lot of strength in its jaw to be able to move over to other to other things. Now, when I go up there, um, up to the Arctic, I do see, and I've seen it more often over the last 10 years, I do see polar bears munching on all sorts of like scurvy grass and things like this, trying to fill their bellies with more food. And we've 
even seen in lecture that video from the One Planet series of the polar bears doing different things. Yeah. In that case, chasing and trying to hunt beluga whales. That's right. So they are individually trying to adapt. They're really smart. So they're like working on it, right? Um, but whether or not they're going to be able to do that at an evolutionary scale is going to be another, another question, right? If they're able to produce the offspring that are going to also be able to, to overcome the challenges. But hybridization, and what I hope that, that you've learned today is that hybridization happened in the past. All of the polar bears that we now have are hybrids, right? And so it's entirely possible um, that what we're seeing is basically another kind of reset of that. It's really kind of like a a back cross in terms of the the genetics right where you're going back uh and you're rehybridizing with a with a brown bear so they're just going to become more brown bear ish than they have been in the past and remember the we're talking hundreds of thousands of years which is not actually from an evolutionary perspective not that long these are so and and species speciation tends to be messy like this, that, that species, the, the ability to interbreed, that's like an ancestral trait. So, <laughs> on so Twitter, I, I have a way I think of it. So on Twitter recently, somebody started this really fun uh, thread. Start a fight. Yeah, it was start a science fight, right? So basically say something super controversial and like fight me on it, right? So one person, who was it? I think it was Alex Wilde. Oh, Alex Wilde, who's who's wonderful to follow. So so follow Alex Wilde if Some you want to. Some of the best to. insect photographs in the world ever. Yeah, really, really cool research. Yeah, lovely guy. Yeah. Um, anyway, said, species aren't a thing. Fight, fight me. me. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought that that was really good. Um, yeah, so species can be a thing. Um, especially when we're talking about conservation policy and management, it's easier for people to grapple the concept of species and understand the, the line. And it's wonderful to be in this sort of flex space where we understand the nuance associated with those lines and the fuzziness, um, because that's where the biology is, right? That's where all of the theory and all of the amazing things that happen that we can discover really, really can be found, I think. Yep, species, I think, so I would fight them. Species are a thing. <laughs> Speciation is a process, and that process can take orders of magnitude more time to happen, yeah. then we have opportunity to study. And so often we're confused because we're looking too closely in too small of a time period. Sorry if I shone through anybody's. <laughs> I'm blind. <Yeah. laughs> that was pretty smart, Smith. Uh, sometimes it happens. Yeah. If you say enough things, sometimes smart things tumble out to close together. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Okay, so this was homework. Don't worry about it. Um, and this, this is old, but it might actually help you understand the story because it's so simple. We leave it yeah. So we leave it here for you and we'll be posting this. So the idea is brown bears and polar bears diverged a little while ago and then they got back together. Oh, even less a little of a little while ago and they're getting back together again. So it's kind of neat. The whole story. So Pete Townsend said, meet the new boss. Yeah. Same as the old boss. <laughs> Cool. Well, we hope you liked today's story. Um, we'll have a couple more for you. We have to figure out when classes end. Um, we will post the <laughs> information about the um, the final exam as soon as we can get our shit together and, and get it up there. It will be uh, very accommodating. And if it does not accommodate your needs, get in touch. We can talk about it. Somebody uh, suggested that uh, two things. One of them is this is the maybe the perfect representation of an on again, off again relationship. I like that. And then the other was a Ross and Rachel. We were on a break. We were on a break. No, we weren't. <laughs> <laughs> That's super fun. That's very good. Thank you very much for all of your participation and engagement. Put your right hand in the air, pat yourself on the back. Very well done. Well done. Very we well can done. shake hands. Ashanti. Okay, yeah. good. Take care, guys. See you Wednesday. <laughs> How is somebody not muted there? I don't know.